Hey folks, Rob Avis here with Verge Permaculture. I've been getting a lot of questions about our advanced passive solar greenhouse design course, specifically what the five week intensive is like and what people get out of the Q&A sessions. So we decided that we would share an example of a Q&A session, which you'll see following this little intro clip. Um, so you can get a sense of the types of questions that people are asking and how the Q&A session runs. What's really unique about this session is that we're committed to your success. And so as you're going through the content, we make sure that we meet on a weekly basis for five weeks to address any problems or concerns or issues that you're having with your design. Once we've gotten through the bulk of the questions through the course of about an hour, we will allow people to share their screens at the end and they can actually upload their illustrations or their designs um, and share them with the class as well as with me um, to, to get feedback on whether or not that design is actually going to work. So I thought we'd produce this video and put it out to the world so that you can get a sense of what our Q&A sessions are like so you can judge for yourself whether this course is a fit for you. If you want more information about the Advanced Passive Solar Greenhouse Design course, I'll put a link to it in the show notes below. And if you're just starting your journey, make sure you check very carefully in those show notes because we'll leave a free 30 minute video that you can watch today uh, which gives you a very uh, good introduction to our 10-step design process that we use to design these passive solar greenhouses. Lastly, if you have any questions about the course, get in touch with me. Send me an email and let's schedule a call and we can have a conversation to see if this course is actually going to be a fit for you. Thanks so much, guys. I hope you enjoy watching the video and leave any comments that you have in the comment section below. Okay, so um, Luke, should we get into those questions then? Yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> so what was the first question we saw come through? Well, let's, uh, uh, are we going to do the stop and start thing on this? Uh, yeah, this call? yeah okay, let's great. do that. And hey, you know what, Rob, um, why don't you just, you just take it away. I'll turn my video off and then I'll just handle the stop start um, recording and all that good stuff. And then, Perfect. and then if anything comes up, just say the word. Okay, sounds great, man. Cool. All right, uh, so the first question was uh, Scott Keating. So uh, his question was, where do we find the recorded sessions if we can't attend live? So Scott, all of that information is going to be in the Small Farm Academy uh, dashboard. Uh, and if you're referring to these sessions right here, Luke will send out all the information in an email that uh, lets you know how to get access to these recordings, if these are the ones that you're referring to. Um, there you go. Luke will post a link in, in the, um, right now in the chat there. So yeah. Just... And I'll, okay. So just to clarify, thanks Rob. Um, I'll send a link to everybody and then, um, I'll put a link right here. Basically any, if you go into any of the learning units in the course on the sidebar, you can see the, the schedule of the, up of all the classes today's and the next four weeks. And if you actually click on those links, they'll take you to either the live call or if it's in the past, it'll take you to the recording. And so I'll post a, a link to um, basically the, a, a unit and then you can look at the sidebar and see is there. Right, okay, great. Uh, okay, great. Uh, next question by, from Ross. Uh, Ross asks, do you have any recommendations for CAD software for developing our design? I do actually, but I actually have a couple of questions for you uh, before I answer that. So the first question is, do you have any experience with CAD? Um, and if the answer is yes, then um, that might change my answer. If the answer is no, the next question that I have is, do you actually want to learn CAD software? It can be a bit of a steep learning curve. Um, and so this has been a problem that, that I've faced as an engineer. Um, I'm not a CAD person. Um, I do a little bit of CAD, but not a lot. And so I actually have a team of people that I work with to help me to develop my concepts and my concept plans. And I'm happy to share those um, people with you. Um, and it's surprisingly cost effective. So what I've generally told people to do is if you're good with a pencil and paper, then um, just draw it out on, on pencil and paper with pencil and paper and um, use a ruler and, and detail it out properly. Um, and then from there, we can get you engaged with an architect or with uh, a drafts person that can actually take your designs and um, bring them to fruition. And I can actually show you an example of, um, if you're in the course, you've probably seen some of the plans, but um, I wanna show you just quickly, it's a bit of a side, um, 
it's a bit of a side uh, step here in terms of answering the question, but I think it's it's worth you guys taking a look at this just to get a sense of what's possible and uh, how cost effective it can be. Um, so before you go and buy some CAD software, unless you're going to be doing a lot of CAD work, um, Michelle and I are working on a passive solar greenhouse as well. We're actually calling it, um, we haven't released this yet, it's called Homestead in a Box. And uh, it's specifically to address a couple of uh, big social issues that we've uh, faced where, where people are not necessarily able to get access to land. Um, they want to have their own um, home and they've got a little bit of capital, but they don't want to necessarily get into a mortgage. And so this actually has a passive solar greenhouse built into it. I'm just going to show this to you. And so all I did to produce this was I produced some hand drawings and then I work with a, a, a graphic artist and a, and a CAD person. And I think this has cost me about $150 to produce outside of my time. So, um, so that's one of the images there. Um, and the idea is that it's two yurts um, with a, a shipping container, container in the middle and a passive solar greenhouse coming off the front end of, um, of this structure. And so all the rainwater is harvested, it harvests its own solar energy. Um, and it's allowed me to kind of wrap my head around the spatial kind of issues. And then I can pump this into my uh, greenhouse tool to understand how much energy and, and all of the other metrics that you guys are going to learn how to address. Um, and so inside the shipping container, we've got a small kitchen, a bathroom, a mechanical room, and a little eating nook. Um, and then in the greenhouse, we've got a microgreens operation. Um, this is going to be a future tropical food forest. Um, and then veggie greens basically going on on the front there. Um, and just to kind of make it a little bit more visual, once you've got it drawn out with one of these folks, then they can easily go and turn it into um, a video, which allows you again to kind of get a sense of the space uh, and how it all goes together. So uh, this is a great question because so much of our design these days requires the use of um, three-dimensional rendering and stuff to get a better sense of space and how it's all gonna fit together. Um, and you know the world of drafting has totally changed from when I was in the oil and gas industry and, and the possibilities are almost endless now. Um, so this just gives you a bit of a sense of what's, what's possible. And I'm producing a bunch of other digital assets as a result of this as well. So it'll give you a sense of, of um, what we're capable of doing for not that much money anymore. All right. So um, hopefully that answered your question. Now, the, well, the, the actual question that you asked was what software do you recommend? So if you're just getting started and you want to trial something out, Google SketchUp is a really great piece of software because it integrates with Google Earth Pro. So you can actually take that three-dimensional model that you build in Google SketchUp. It's really easy to learn. There's a ton of uh, tutorials for free on YouTube. And if you really like the software, you can end up buying the, the full pro version, um, which gives you all sorts of new functionality. So you might want to check that out. Um, and then uh, if you're more inclined to use two-dimensional CAD, then, um, you know, I, I don't do a lot of work with two-dimensional CAD anymore. Most of the stuff that I do is uh, in a program called SmartDraw, and all I'm doing in two-dimensional CAD at this point is mechanical drawings. So uh, mostly line drawings, understanding how uh, energy flows from one place to another, whether it's water, air, um, or electricity. So mostly line drawings. And then when I do 3D, I do it by hand. And then I work with another drafts person. All right. So I'm just going to answer these here. Okay, done. Do we have any recommendations? Perfect. Okay. So the next question um, is from John. Since my design is approximately 2,750 square feet, would you recommend thermal dynamic heat loss modeling? If so, what resources do you recommend and would SketchUp be okay instead of CAD? So yeah, I, I think I just addressed that in the last question. So SketchUp is a great piece of software to start working with. And if you like it, you can buy the pro version of it, which gives you a bunch of optionality and access to uh, what are called plan view drawings. You can't do that with the free version of, of SketchUp. So you need to actually buy, I think it's 800 bucks. Um, and yes, yeah, so this course is gonna help you to do a feasibility study on your 2,700 square foot greenhouse. And it's gonna get you um, really close in terms of, you know, you'll be able to determine whether or not this greenhouse is gonna be feasible based on the energy load that, um, that we're anticipating using the model. However, due to the cost of building a structure of that size, I do recommend that um, you do some thermodynamic modeling. 
So what I would recommend for right now is move through the program, run it through the model, and let's see what the results are on the back end. And from there, I can make some recommendations on what the next steps might look like for thermodynamic modeling um, in order to optimize whether it's glazing, your wall R value, your subterranean heating and cooling system, or any of the other systems inside of the space um, that you might need to optimize. So this is a gr great first place to start before we introduce uh, more detailed thermodynamic modeling uh, procedures. Let's get through uh, the course as it is right now, and then we can uh, move into a more complex analysis if required. Thanks for the question. All right, Kevin, uh, where is the extreme min for energy, extreme max for climate data? So Kevin, I need a little bit more information. Um, if, if you're talking about the extreme minimum temperature, you're going to have to look that up on your local climatic database. And so in the U.S., that's going to come from NOAA. Um, if you're in Canada, that's going to come from the uh, climate normal section in the Environment Canada website. Both for those two countries, I have um, screen shared videos, excuse me, screen shared videos that show you how to navigate those two websites to find that information. Um, if you're calling outside of Canada, the US, then you're going to have to find the equivalent in your country. And I'd love to know what that equivalent is. Um, if it's not in English, then I'm not going to be able to help much, but um, um, it'd be good to just reach out and let us know um, if you have found that outside of Canada and the US and where it is so that we can document that for future people. For example, if you're calling in from Budapest, um, where do you find that data in, in Budapest? Um, so if you want to clarify that question a little bit more, if I didn't answer it, by all means, uh, do so in the chat window and um, I'll happily answer it again. So thanks for the question. Um, okay, so Jordan McPhee asks, what does CAD stand for? So CAD is an acronym. Uh, engineers are horrible for using acronyms. We use them all the time and we should really just use the full word. So CAD stands for Computer Assisted Drafting Software or Drawing Software sometimes. And uh, AutoCAD is probably the most common one, but um, SketchUp is a good one and Revit and um, uh, Civil 3D. I mean, there's just an unlimited number of CAD pro programs these days. So CAD stands for Computer Assisted Design. Thanks for the question. And if I use any acronyms, uh, feel free to call me on it and I'll uh, make sure I clarify those acronyms for you. Jen, I'm not planning on having artificial lighting. What do I enter into the average sun hours line item as it is colored as mandatory? Um, I just fill out the, the, um, the average sun hours. Um, it's interesting for you to gather that information regardless of whether you can use artificial lighting or not just to get a better sense of um, your ecosystem. So go and collect that data and if you don't use it, um, that's totally fine. Okay, thanks for the question, Jen. Okay, folks, um, so if you have any other questions, by all means, put it up there. I'm gonna just gonna check the chat here um, just to make sure um, that we're up to speed on everything. Um, yep, looks like we are. So if you have any other questions for this week, and it's okay if we have a, a shorter session this week, we don't have to make it the full hour. Um, I certainly don't wanna uh, waste your guys' time. Um, and we may end up making that time up in future sessions as everybody gets caught up with the content. Um, I'm going to just head over to the email that I got sent here um, and have a quick read of that while you guys are coming up with some new questions and just make sure that I've answered uh, Lyle's um, email here that he sent. So um, just have a quick peek of that. So feel free to put your questions in there. I'm not ignoring you. I'm just reading an email here. Um, just give me two seconds to work through it. Cool. And you know what? I'm just going to read this to you guys. So, cause I think this is a, a good email here. So, uh, hi Luke, I'm looking forward to the course. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm a 64 year old logger in Halliburton, Ontario with lots of building and construction experience. That's going to be a huge ace in your, uh, in your sleeve there, Lyle. That's great. Logging this winter and can keep hemlock logs at no cost. But this hemlock has to be logged this year. I can have the hemlock logs milled at no cost. Therefore my lumber costs may be restricted to trucking alone. Fantastic. Greenhouse is a retirement plan or project. I'm taking this course and it allows me to plan ahead, sizing my lumber, quality of lumber, and identify which projects need to be finished prior to building the greenhouse, new septic bed, et cetera. Um, 
Please see the two attachments of my idea where I'd like to cite our greenhouse and my initial drawings that I'd like to do. So questions, can, I, can an in-ground ventilation system drain away from the building root cellar into a catch basin? Our best available location for piping is below grade. So I'd need a little more details on that, uh, Lyle, before I can properly answer that. Perhaps your, your pictures will answer that question for me. Number two, does the pitch of the greenhouse glazing need to be a specific calculation for sun angle or does using polycarbonate make this calculation more flexible? And if so, then is a minimum pitch of the greenhouse glazing calculated by what will shed snow load? So great question. You guys are gonna get to this in the next couple of modules. I, I believe it's after five. I have to look again at, at how the course is laid out. It's been a while since I've taught it, um, but I definitely address that question. And I'll address it right now really quickly just because you've asked it and we've got some time. Um, so depending on the glazing material that you choose, if it's polycarbonate or solar wrap, um, which would likely be two likely scenarios for you out in Ontario, um, your glazing angle is going to be dictated by snow load, as you've mentioned here. It's not going to be dictated by sun angle, and that is because these two materials tend to split light, which means that they don't suffer from the same consequences as glass, which uh, does not split light in the same way. And so we generally will specify the glazing angle um, in order to minimize the trusses um, so that we're not having too many trusses or that our trusses are too big to support the glazing on the front. So a steeper angle is going to allow for thinner trusses, which is gonna save you money. In this case, you're getting the wood for free, um, but it'll mean that you use less lumber. And one of the disadvantages of having really big trusses, guys, and I'm actually gonna ask you that question, what would one of the disadvantages of having really um, large webs on your truss actually be? And if I need to, I can draw that for you guys so you understand. Shading, absolutely. Riva's on it. Um, so as you get really, really deep trusses, um, you're gonna actually obst obstruct sunlight. And the thing is, is if they're deep and you've got them spaced really close together, and you'll see when you guys get into the case studies, Hull Services has this. Hull services trusts are quite deep and they're spaced pretty close together. Um, and so it does obstruct quite a bit of light. So you do need to con consider that um, as part of your design. And this is one of the advantages of having um, steel trusses. I think G Jason has these steel trusses uh, because they're largely open. And so you've got two, two steel cords and then um, you've got these steel cords kind of going in between it, forming triangles all the way along. You get a lot of sight sun penetration through those types of, of systems versus the um, versus wood ones, which is what you'll see in the uh, Hull Services case study example. Perfect. Okay. Um, next question from Lyle: Does polycarbonate come in specific size, or are there a variety of widths and lengths? So generally speaking, they come in four foot widths, and then they extrude it. So you could theoretically, if, if you um, wanted to, you could probably get them at 48 feet because a, a general uh, tractor trailer will go up to 52, I think. Um, so somewhere between 48 and 52 feet, you know, theoretically you could get them that long if you wanted to. A uh, couple things to think about with polycarbonate, it expands and contracts. Okay, so when you're putting in the, the tracks on your greenhouse, you wanna make sure you leave a little bit of airspace in the, uh, the H channel extrusions so that as the polycarbonate expands, it's got somewhere to go and it doesn't bow up. Um, and then generally speaking, and it's going to depend on the type of polycarbonate that you choose so that you can get some pretty thick stuff like 24 mil thick, which has an incredibly high snow load. Um, but if you go to some of the thinner stuff, you're going to have to support it, uh, you know, more often with purlins or other, um, structural elements. Um, and so the structural design is going to depend on the glazing surface that you choose. It's a bit of an iterative, uh, process that you have to sort out. Um, and if you are calling from Canada, the drawings that I've provided are not stamped. So regardless, if you use those drawings, you're going to have to get a local civil engineer involved. And that is because our snow loads in this country can vary so widely. Like Halliburton, you guys have a pretty high snow load, I believe, versus, uh, you know, Calgary it can be high, but it's definitely not going to be as high as Halliburton or even in BC places like Revelstoke. Okay, next uh, comment or question was, do you know what spacing is between posts and Curtis's greenhouse. You know what? I don't have the answer to that. I believe, uh, and it depends on the posts that you're talking about. If it's posts along the main primary roof line, I believe it's 12 feet, but I could be wrong. I'd have to go and look at that. 
um, in terms of his actual greenhouse. And then if you're looking at the post spacing on the plan set, um, it doesn't matter what they are because you have to get a civil engineer involved to make sure that it meets your local um, building requirements. So um, uh, if you guys, and this is mostly on the Western part of Canada, if you guys need access to a very cost-effective civil engineer, I can put you in touch with one. Uh, out in Ontario, I don't have a civil engineer that I could contact, but it shouldn't, once you have your set of plans, it shouldn't cost you more than about 400 bucks to get it stamped so that you can go and construct it and feel safe that the snow loads are going to be uh, more than accommodated uh, for. All right, so we've got a few more questions here. I'm just gonna take a look at the comments before I get back in the Q&A. So Jason says, yep, they're, they're open, uh, two and a half inches. Um, Kevin says, I did find the data on Noah and watched your video on extreme min. So when entering extreme max, oh, do we use the same info on the data page? So the extreme maximum temperature is not something that the model uses. Um, uh, that initial climatic data sheet there is, is just so that you guys, some of the data is needed in the model and some of it's not. I want you guys to do a really thorough investigation as to the climatic um, regime that you're trying to build something in. And this, I do this for a number of reasons. If you're gonna build more than one greenhouse, these data sheets will be useful uh, in the design and construction of future greenhouses because then you can look back on your past work and compare them to see um, what, especially after something gets constructed, you can go and look at that extreme data and then determine um, basically have a feedback mechanism there. So that's why. Um, the, uh, and so, so even though there's more data than the model actually uses there, it's worth filling it out is, is what I'd like you to do. The extreme maximum temperature does not play into any of the other stuff down the road uh, in that tool there. All right, so let's get back into the Q&A here. Ross, where can we find more specifics on building the geothermal storage materials and specifications? So that comes later in the course, and I'm sure we'll do a whole big session on that uh, when we get to that point. So I'm gonna put that question into the parking lot because I know we're gonna get to it in session four or five. Thanks for the question though. Everybody wants to know about uh, geothermal heat storage. I had a really cool conversation with, uh, was it John? I think it was John. Was it John? You'll know, I think you're on the call right now. I just have to, Jordan, sorry, with Jordan about uh, geothermal heat storage. And so um, one of the things that, uh, maybe I should just draw it for you guys here. Let me just plug in my document camera and we'll just um, eject. Just give me two seconds here, guys, to set this up. Okay, just ejecting. I just need to get a, a um, USB port to put this document camera in, and then I'll draw a little drawing for you guys. One of the things that we talk about towards the end of the course is this concept of integrated design, and I, I think it's never too early to talk about integrated design, so I'm going to take a few minutes right now and just have a conversation with you guys about it, and then we'll address those other questions up in the Q&A session there. Um, so greenhouses always produce a surplus of thermal energy and you pretty much can't put it all to productive use. Um, heat storage itself is very hard to do. Um, and at best you can typically recover about 50% of what you put back into the ground. And so we always have to keep that in mind. We can't get too greedy. When we get greedy, we start spending enormous amounts of money um, trying to um, attain lower and lower yields. So I'm just gonna pull up my document camera here and then you guys can watch what we were talking about because I think it was a kind of a neat idea. And I'll just just uh, set up my document cam. Okay, and then hit share. All right, so let's just focus and Okay, perfect. So what Jordan is talking about doing is building a passive solar greenhouse on the side of a shed, um, which will be for um, food cleaning or, or vegetable cleaning and, and, and packaging. So I kind of visualized it as this, so standard shed or um, standard gable roof. And um, 
and then they want to put a greenhouse off of the front here. Okay. Oh, is that coming uh, off crooked there, guys? Probably is. There we go. That's probably easier to see. Okay. So I have to, let me just adjust my camera here, guys. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. So we've got our, our greenhouse right here on the front, which means that this is south. Okay. If you're in the Northern hemisphere and just to kind of give you a sense of scale here, Let me just, probably a person would be like, like yay, okay? Just to give you a sense of scale. And, and so typically, and you'll get into this when you get further into the course, we have these low vents and high vents. Well, one of the challenges that we have when we put a greenhouse up against the shed is where do your high vents go? And you, you only have so many choices. And again, we'll go into more detail later in the course on this. One option is to put a fan in here. And the fan is basically gonna suck air out of the east and west side of the greenhouse. Um, but unfortunately it uses electricity, which we try and avoid whenever we can. It's not always something that we can avoid. Um, and so when I was talking to Jordan, um, what I was thinking was, uh, why not put in a concrete floor in here with a shallow footing Okay, so you've got this concrete floor right here. We can put in a subterranean heating and cooling system, which again, we'll talk about in a future program, which will deal with some of the heat, but it's never gonna get all of it. Okay, and so those are basically heat systems that store heat underground. And they actually act as both heat storage and heat supply. Um, and we'll talk about how to design those. And the tool specifically has uh, software to help you guys make these designs correctly. But we could also put in a fan right in here with some ductwork. And I don't think this would cost very much. And then before you lay the slab down, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You could literally get two pieces of Q-deck. Q-deck is what you use on commercial buildings. I had a fellow... Uh, a friend in the permaculture community here in Calgary telling me how he was setting up his solar air system and he was using a, a Q deck. And so Q deck is these is the decking they use on commercial buildings to create floors. And they usually pour concrete on top of this stuff. And so if you put two of them together and seal it up, you could create a manifold on one end and you could blow your hot air from your greenhouse. As soon as the temperature up here got hot enough, to fire this fan on and then you'd heat underneath the floor underneath your concrete slab and so the cost would basically be a little bit of Q-deck which is metal so you're going to get a really great um, heat conductance um, and now in the winter time like you could basically tell this fan to turn on at certain times of the year now you have in-floor heat and as the air is cooling down under the floor in this space um, we can return this air because he doesn't want to necessarily have this greenhouse air in his production facility. You can return this air back into the greenhouse cooled and just have a closed loop system essentially. So you're not really affecting the um, inner air in here. So the reason I'm showing you this guys is that when we, one of the reasons that as an engineer, I uh, have been so keen on permaculture is that there's very little stuff in the uh, engineering literature on how to create integrated design. It's just becoming something that people are starting to pay attention to. And by integrated design, what I mean is uh, trying to match the needs of one system from the yields of another. So in this case, the yields of the greenhouse is surplus thermal energy. And during the shoulder and winter seasons, the needs of the production facility is, is a heating system. And so if you put the right insulation underneath the floor here, um, this then becomes a diurnal, which means daily thermal battery. So we can take surplus thermal energy from this greenhouse and maybe get two, three, four days of thermal energy stored under the slab of this space, thus eliminating a whole bunch of additional energy to keep this space actually warm. And so now the greenhouse benefits from this shared common wall. 
as well as anything produced in here that's going to be processed is right next to it. And the common, the, the production facility benefits from the excess thermal energy of the greenhouse. Um, and we're not worrying about vapor or um, humidity from the greenhouse because we're actually running this through uh, a subsurface system where the air is not going to co-mingle between the two spaces there. <coughs> and so as we get into the course, we're going to start thinking more about integrated design. Can we put a hot tub in there? Can we put a sauna in there? Can we put a food dehydrator in there? You know, if the greenhouse needs thermal energy at certain times of the year, can we do our dehydrating when the greenhouse actually needs that thermal energy? Maybe at night. Um, and so let's start trying to find ways as we're, as we're starting to brainstorm about greenhouses on how we can integrate needs and yields of these systems um, to create unique combinations that we haven't seen in the past. So hopefully that made sense. All right. Um, so uh, I'm just going to go back to the comments and then we'll go to the questions again. So Ross says, how will water condensation from the system on the shed on the condensation from the system on the shed handled. So I'm not, uh, Ross, I need you to just, I'd like you to put that question actually into the Q and A session if that's possible. And maybe when you rewrite it, put a little bit more um, uh, clearly. So how is the condensation from the system gonna be handled under the shed? I, I'm assuming you're talking about in the Q deck, you're gonna have to think about that for sure. And so sometimes that will be, um, if you do have a humidity issue in the air, which is totally possible in the um, in the greenhouse, you may need to have a common condensation collection point. So that could be that the Q deck is on a 2% grade and it's collected in the manifold on one end of the, um, the system. Um, and that wouldn't be too hard to do. You just need to have a condensate uh, pickup and then a small little condensate pump or potentially drain it off somewhere else on site. Jordan, uh, asks, this is almost exactly what I drew up uh, right now. Great, awesome. Okay, uh, next question from Jen. I have two projects to develop through this course. One is a small residential greenhouse that can be easily implemented into a backyards. And the other is a specific greenhouse for a friend. It is more like a wallapini. I know you have concerns regarding wallapinis, but will I be able to develop a design for one through this greenhouse course and the tool? Uh, yes, absolutely. And so, Jen, um, the Wallapini will be slightly different because uh, essentially what's happening with a Wallapini is you're creating different boundary conditions. And so the heat loss from the tool that you currently have is not optimized for Wallapinis. And so for you, uh, and this goes for anybody, if that's really what you want to design, then we have to go back to base principles and um, I'll have to take you through the um, heat loss equation. And I can totally do that. And it's not as complex or overwhelming as it sounds. Um, it just means that um, four of the walls that would typically be exposed to your extreme northern temperature of minus 30, let's say Celsius, which is close to minus 30 Fahrenheit, um, will be exposed to ground temperature at closer to call it 38 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius. And so your heat loss um, quantities are gonna be different on the Wallapini. In other words, the tool will assume a higher heat loss, which is not necessarily a bad thing. So that's something to be aware of with the Wallapini. Um, with regards to the residential greenhouse, it'll be a piece of cake, no problem. So if you really need to do the Wallapini, um, we probably have to have a chat on why you shouldn't do a Wallapini. Um, or make sure that it's actually a fit for what you're trying to do. And then you may have to do some um, custom heat loss calculations on the side for that particular greenhouse. Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, Riva, I'm sure that we will maybe get into this later in time, but how small is too small and how big is too big? Financial is obviously a barrier. Specifically, I would like a similar operation to what Curtis Stone has, growing, cleaning, processing, potentially walk-in cooler storing. So this is coming right back to this week's concepts, which is essentially, uh, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? Um, we always have to start with our values and vision statement. So what, uh, what is our vision for our property? And in this case, for our greenhouse. And, um, and what does this greenhouse have to do for you? And that's how you're going to dictate um, your size. As a rule of thumb, guys, and this is just something good to know about going in, unless you're like Lyle and you've got access to really cost-effective lumber, 
about 30 to $100 a square foot is pretty reasonable for one of these greenhouses. And um, uh, I know Curtis, is, Curtis spent about 30 bucks a square foot. He did some of the labor himself. Um, and he thought that he could actually optimize that down even lower. So maybe as low as 20 bucks a square foot. Um, and so just keep that in mind when you're trying to decide on a size. Um, I have a student in Calgary and I'm going to go profile him in a week or two from now, actually. So you guys will get an updated case study on that. And he's producing a greenhouse that flies under the land use bylaw requirement. So it's less than hundred square feet. And he's doing this specifically for uh, the new um, cannabis legalization. So he's tr helping people to create their own backyard uh, greenhouses for medicinal purposes. Um, and his thought was if I did it below hundred square feet, I wouldn't have to get um, a building permit to put it up. So that's kind of a neat idea. I wouldn't go much smaller than that. And then how big is too big? There is really no too big. Um, it's going to come probably down to budget. And so, uh, like I said earlier, if you go beyond probably about 2000 square feet, 1500, 2000 square feet, you're going to want to do some analysis on that greenhouse before you go and build it to make sure that you're optimizing the R value, the ventilation and any thermal mass, um, uh, designs that you're going to end up implementing, specifically subterranean heating and cooling systems. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay, next question from Jen. Uh, you covered this question in good detail in module two, but I wanted to clarify. You mentioned that ideally greenhouse orientation should be within 30 degrees of south, optimally being 15 degrees east of south. Does this mean that 15 degrees to the west of south is okay, although not ideal. So yes, Jen, it's totally okay to go to the west. The reason that we generally optimize towards east though is to um, get that early morning heat because our greenhouse is gonna be coldest first thing in the morning and it's gonna be hottest last thing in the day. And so orienting slightly to the west is gonna mean that when our greenhouse is already hot, you're giving it another kick of heat right at the end of the day versus what we should be doing is trying to capture that early morning sunlight to preheat the space as early as we can and then rejecting that late afternoon sunlight so that we're not having uh, things too hot or hotter than it already needs to be um, because it's oriented to the west. However, your greenhouse will get enough sunlight within, for sure, within 30 degrees of south in either direction. Thanks for the question. Jordan, in the winter, after a sunny day of eight hours at minus 30, what would the temperature be at night? So um, what you guys will find when you go through the design tool is that the highest heat loss in your greenhouse is going to happen as a result of the glazing material. So your greenhouse could approximate minus 20, Jordan, um, if you don't design it with some of the tips that I'm about to give you. Um, the R value on the glazing surface in your greenhouse is going to be around um, probably around R2 is pretty typical for a decent uh, polycarbonate. And so this is almost nothing when compared to the wall systems, which are going to be as high as R20, R30. And so what I recommend that folks do is that they set their greenhouses up with a thermal curtain. And so a thermal curtain is basically going to be a removable curtain that might have an R value anywhere from two to eight. And this thing's literally with a spreader bar going to be able to be pulled across the glazing surface. Now, when you get into the spreadsheet, what you'll find is that 50 to 60% of the heat loss happens through the glazing and it's assuming that it's happening at nighttime. And so what we can do at night when there's no sun coming in is we can put this thermal curtain on at night and we can take it's, it's really interesting to experiment with this in the tool and we can talk more about this in future weeks. But what's really cool is that when you uh, increase, you can basically fool the tool into thinking that there's a thermal curtain there. And so you can take the R value of two of your glazing surface and double it to four and pretend that there's a thermal curtain there. And what you'll notice is that you can cut 33 to 50% of the heat loss of your greenhouse out just by putting in a thermal curtain. So what that means from an operational perspective is that you're going to um, pull that curtain when the sun goes down at night and then pull it back open when the sun comes up during the day. Now, this means that if you're not heating your greenhouse, um, your greenhouse is going to stay much closer to its peak temperature or, or its, its average temperature during the day. And if you are gonna heat it, it means that you can do it with almost nothing. Um, so, 
Our, we have to understand where our weak link is. And when you get into the tool, what's really great about the data visualization is that it really illustrates where that heat is being lost through which elements, which, which components, so that you can address it with specific design um, approaches to, uh, and spend money in the right places. So for example, if you're building your greenhouse and you notice that all the heat's going out of the glazing and your walls are at R20, well, it makes no economic sense to go to R30 because what you'll notice in the tool is that adding an additional R10 into the wall system is gonna have almost no effect to the heat loss of that greenhouse because it's all coming out of the glazing. So pay very close attention to the tool and to the data visualization because it'll give you a lot of clues um, with regards to the thermal dynamics of the building itself. I wanted to have that data visualization there so that if you don't know what a BTU or a kilojoule uh, is you can at least understand bar graphs and pie charts. That's the most important thing. You don't need to worry about the units, just worry about the uh, data visualization in the tool itself. Thanks, Jordan. Ross says, uh, per your request, question answered. How will water condensation for the system under the shed from the humid greenhouse air be handled? And so again, what we would do is we would put whatever air ducts that we have under the ground on a slight angle, so positive drainage, and then we would pick it up in a manifold, which would also have positive drainage and likely put it into some sort of a condensate drum or barrel that we could pump out uh, from time to time, ensuring that uh, we don't end up with a whole bunch of water being picked up under, underneath there. Great question. And when we get into the subterranean heating and cooling system, Ross, um, all of our uh, pipes that we put under the earth generally are perforated. And so that additional moisture is gonna get absorbed into the ground which may not be a big deal in a greenhouse, but it might not be a good idea underneath a, a concrete foundation in a shop like Jordan is proposing. <clears throat> Jordan, inside the greenhouse, hoping temps inside won't drop below 15 degrees at night during the winter. And Jordan's calling from Canada, so that's 15 degrees Celsius um, at night. So that, so that would be uh, 40, 48 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit just for folks that are converting. Uh, during the night, the winter, so he, we can continue growing basil uh, hydroponically. So you may have to put in a, and, and I think for your commercial operation, Jordan, you're going to want to have a backup heater in here. And so the backup heater might be uh, set up with a thermostat at 15 degrees Celsius, um, such that if the uh, operation ever does drop below 15, it'll kick on and add a little bit of heat. Now, given that you're calling in from PEI, um, you have two, one, a couple of really good options. Um, you know, you can definitely put a wood stove in there so that if you are on the farm, you can heat with a little bit of wood. Um, and then uh, something that I've, I noticed when I was out on the East Coast is that you guys are uh, rapidly adopting um, what are called mini splits. And so these are air to air, to air heat pumps. Um, they're very efficient. Um, and uh, that might be a really good option for, for your neck of the woods. So something to investigate as part of this project. All right, uh, John, might not be applicable to modules one and two, but what options are there for prefabricated metal trusses and framing? I think our size of 2750, um, that wood is not a good choice. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. And John, I would um, check out the, the Groundswell Passive Solar Greenhouse case study uh, in the course, and, because what they did there was they took a hoop house, so a large commercial um, hoop house greenhouse, and they cut it down the middle, and then they built a shed style structure on the back, and then put the hoops off the front. Um, and the nice thing with that is that if you're going with a commercial style greenhouse, it's going to be set up for polycarbonate. Um, it's going to have um, motorized ventilation equipment that you can uh, build as part of the frame. Um, and that case study is going to give you all sorts of insights on how to set that up. And then if you are ever up in uh, British Columbia, um, you can organize a tour of the Groundswell Passive Solar Greenhouse, which we're involved with, um, to get a sense of um, kind of what went right and what went wrong there. Um, and then the other thing I'd recommend, because I would recommend reaching out and uh, um, chatting with Jason Ewart on this call, because Jason's got some really cool plans um, that you're probably going to want to take a look at. And I bet you guys could uh, scratch each other's heads there and come up with some really neat uh, co-concepts uh, based on what you guys are working on. So um, maybe exchange some um, 
your contact information with Jason there on the chat window and you guys should have a phone call together. Okay. Um, Jen, when will your Calgary student be doing the 100 square foot greenhouse be profiled? I'd love to get in touch with him. It actually sounds very similar to my objectives. Perfect. Uh, so his name is Jeremy and Jen, you know how to get in touch with me. So send me an email and I would happily put you guys in touch. Um, I will probably be filming him, I think next week. And then it usually takes three or four days to produce a case study um, once I've got all the stuff. But given I'm launching my book this week, it might take an extra week. We'll just see. Um, not sure about that yet, but it's coming. And I'm happy to put you in touch with Jeremy. Jordan, uh, sorry, just a follow up from above. Okay. Um, Jordan, if you have anything you want to add into that, I'm not sure what that question was about, but I'm um, happy to. Oh, that was it. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, folks. Well, uh, we're at the end of those questions there. Um, <clears throat> Reva says, I see six case studies. Can you say where the ground swell, so it's swell, actually not swallow, but um, ground swell case study. Uh, it's definitely in the one of those six case studies. There should be a total of um, eight case studies. One of them has two 20 minute um, uh, sections in it. So Groundswell is the case study with a large, it's the largest passive solar greenhouse. And I'm sure that uh, Luke can point that out to you. Yeah, the, it's um, real quick. It, there's another name for it and I'm blanking on what the other name is for it. Um, uh, edible Acres. Does that sound right, Rob? Uh, no. Um, no, not Edible Acres. Something else. Let me think a, about it. And... it. It's a community greenhouse. It's the community supported greenhouse at, near the high school. Canmore. Uh, no, Canmore is a, a small version of that one. Okay. That's Edible Let's Acres. See if we can figure it out. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. All right. Um, so I'll just see here if there's any more questions. Looks like we're all. Uh, no, Lacombe is um, a, a geodesic greenhouse. Um, I'll have to get into the course there and just see where it's located. Uh, it's definitely in there though. And uh, that's one of the reasons we did all these case studies so that you guys could see small, large, round, hemispherical, crazy. Is it in there as whole services? No, that's another, that's another big one, actually. <clears throat> Maybe let me just hop into the course here. Oh, Groundswell, the second one. That's right. Yeah, Groundswell, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Here, I'll it's post a link to it. Hang tight. Okay. Okay, I just posted a link to it. Let me know if you guys got it. Okay, perfect. All right, folks. Well, hopefully you got some uh, insights into that. I'm, I'm really happy to have you guys in the course. I love this program. I love watching greenhouses get built. And uh, um, I, I'm really excited about all the questions you've asked today because uh, you guys are definitely thinking along the right uh the right lines and uh, as you guys get through the content you're gonna have all sorts of insights I'd like to um, before we close off today and I know Luke will probably have a couple of announcements so maybe I'll let you make any announcements and then I've got a final question for everybody and then we can uh, close out if there's no more other questions from folks uh, yeah um, so briefly basically uh, well one let us know how you enjoyed this session uh, what you enjoyed about it anything that you'd like to change or do differently and then also, uh, we have the potential to invite you onto the call. So you can turn on your camera, you can turn on your audio and talk with us and, and share designs and share your experience. And I think that's a really valuable thing that we can do if you guys are interested in it. So if that's something you guys are interested in, let us know. And then basically just come prepared to the next class session. And um, we, you know, we'll make time for the focus discussion on modules three and four. And then of course, covering anything regarding one and two. And then also we'll, we'll bring folks on board and, and we can just see each other and see you. And I think it's, it's a nice way to connect. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so my, my final question for you guys, and you can put this up into the chat window. Um, what was your biggest insight from this week? What was the biggest thing that you're, you're taking away from this call? And uh, what are you most excited about working on on your greenhouse? This, those are the two questions. So what's your biggest insight from this week? And what are you most excited about working on your greenhouse? You just put that up into the chat window there. And I'm going to share mine. Um, I'm going to put it up there.
All right. So uh, I am most, oops, that was meant to go to everybody, but it went to Kevin. <laughs> Let me just put that in here. I am most excited about uh, heat storage under the concrete slab that Jordan and I were talking about on the phone before this call. So that's what I'm most charged up about. Yeah, Reva says, most excited about the design. Seems seems like there's a, is much opportunity to really be creative. Awesome. Jordan, most excited. Determining a layout that will economically fit a greenhouse, wash, pack, small office, bathroom, kitchen, and breaks, uh, break space in a 40 by 25 foot area. Possible? I think so. Absolutely. Russ, uh, Ross says, the system you describe for heat dispersion to the shed. I'm building a greenhouse on the south side of a barn. Perfect. John, biggest insight, thermal curtain for minimizing heat loss at night. Most excited for creating a detailed budget for the project. Person, per perfect. Sorry, I can't speak today, guys. Uh, Jordan, sweet. Jen, most excited. The potential in all the design opportunities. Maybe ahead of the curve in my region uh, on this. So there may be other options. Or there may be many options. Perfect. Reva, biggest insight, the amount of technical details that go into designing a greenhouse. Perfect. Jordan, biggest learning that you can put, put air beneath the building to capture heat without collapsing the building. What? Ross, uh, yes, also thermal curtain would like to find a thermostatically controlled way to lower and raise the curtain. So those exist, Ross. Uh, there, there are commercial thermal curtains that you can buy. They're expensive, but here's, this is worth the whole value of the course right here. You can build a thermal curtain uh, out of uh, construction tarps. And I know that there is a way to, uh, that you could probably figure out how to automate it. That'll be a lot less money. So thermal curtains um, that they use in the construction uh, industry are just two layers of tarp with a piece of insulation in the middle. And then it's just a matter of building a spreader system with airplane cables uh, and having a couple of motors, one on each side that will allow it to track um, either way. And I have a whole section on thermal curtains in the course. So uh, pay attention to that. And we could talk, we could talk more about it in future sessions. Um, okay, Jason, the zoom seems to work better as a webinar platform. Thanks, Rob and Luke. Personally, I'm most excited to be able to have a great growing space through the winter. Awesome. Great, Jason. Reva, uh, motors activated by simple home thermostat. Totally. That's totally doable as well. All right, folks. Well, thanks for uh, a great first session. I'm excited to have you guys on board and uh, we'll be here on Zoom next Tuesday. Um, Luke will send you all the details in an email prior to the phone call. And uh, yeah, stay in touch. And um, I don't know, you have anything to add there, Luke? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thanks for the great session today, Rob. Thanks to everyone for the active chat and uh, discussion. And yeah, the, the links again are inside any post unit, uh, any unit in the course, you can find the links to the next calls. But of course, I'll send, um, I'll send the links again in an email beforehand, but just know that they're there and they're ready for you. Um, and I'll, I'll probably make a sticky post in the Facebook group right at the top too that has all the, the links. So in case you're scrambling and want to join the call, there's all different places to find them. So uh, yeah, thanks to everyone. Thank you.